Now, Paul says in verse 10, he says, I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. Now, what's he referring to here? Take no other view about what? About the truth of the gospel, that, that there is no other view. We can have a lot of views about a lot of things when it comes to Christianity, it's end time events, how all that works out. But there's really no other view when it comes to how is a person righteous before God. That, that's what he's talking about in Galatians. Is a person righteous before God by faith in Jesus alone, by faith in Jesus plus works, or by works? How is a person right with God? And how can a person live experiencing a right standing with God every day of their lives. Paul says there's no other view. The, the only view is faith. That, that's it. He, he says the only way a person can be righteous before God is by believing in Jesus, is by trusting in Jesus, is through faith in Jesus. That's what he's talking about throughout all of Galatians. That's what he talks about in the book of Romans righteousness by faith apart from the law. And Paul says, there's no other view. He says, I am confident in the Lord. In the Lord. So where was Paul's confidence when he was teaching this grace message of righteousness by faith? His confidence was in the Lord. Why? Because the Lord Jesus had given him this message to communicate. So he could confidently communicate the message of righteousness by faith apart from the law. And again, most, most pastors believe that. Most mentors believe that. Most disciplers believe that. But then they mix it with yeast, works, and expectations, and then the whole thing is, is ruined. So Paul said, I'm confident in the, in the Lord that you will take no other view on how a person is, becomes righteous before God. It is by faith. There is no other way and there is no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, that's the one who cut in on their grace race. They, became, they, they began to be confused. Paul writes about that in Galatians chapter 1. They were confused about how is a person righteous before God? What makes a person acceptable to God? How are our sins completely forgiven? How are we holy before God? And, and Paul had educated them that it's all by faith. Your righteousness by, is by faith. Your forgiveness is by faith. Your holy standing before God is by faith because Jesus has purified you from all sins. He's completely cleansed you of all sins. You're fully forgiven of all sins. You're innocent before God as if you've never sinned. I mean, that's pretty clear teachings, that's pretty simple teachings, and that's the gospel. But one came in on them, the one who was throwing you into confusion. So now they're confused. Am I righteous before God by faith alone or by faith plus obeying the law of Moses? Do I have to practice the daily calendar of the law and the monthly calendar of the law and the yearly calendar of the law? Do I have to abide by the feasts that are laid out in Deuteronomy? They're laid out in Leviticus. They're laid out in Exodus. Do I have to follow the clock that's tied to the old covenant of law? Or is it simply faith in Jesus? And to, and to the religious system of Paul's day, faith was just too easy. Faith was just too simple because the mentality is if it's just faith, then people are going to go sin. So we got to add some works to it. We got to add some yeast to it. We, we, we got to get something into this batch of dough because grace by itself and faith by itself is going to lead to sin, which you and I both know it does. And it actually leads people out of sin. It leads people into a love relationship with God as Abba Father. It totally changes our and transforms our lives. We still have a battle with the flesh. Paul writes about that in Galatians 15 and 16. So he says, I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view on how a person is righteous. It's not righteousness by faith plus the law or by faith plus works. It's righteousness by faith in Jesus, period. Period. 
and the one who is throwing you into confusion about how a person is righteous before God, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Now, the word penalty here is under, he, he will undergo judgment. All right, it's, it's where we get the word bema seat, right? The judgment, he will undergo judgment. Now, the question is this. So there is, there is a person in, in real time when this book of Galatians or letter to the Galatians people was written, who had infiltrated the churches of Galatia, who had convinced people that righteousness was not by faith in Jesus, but was by believing Jesus was the Messiah, plus adhering to the requirements of the law of Moses. So the people were confused. And Paul says the one who has come into the churches of Galatia promoting this false message, whoever that person may be, that person is going to undergo judgment. So the question is this, when will that judgment happen and how will that judgment happen? So we'll begin, we, we may not finish it in this session. This is session 10 of the Galatians project, we'll, we'll continue it in our Galatians 11 uh, session. But if you will, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We get, we get valuable insight into what Paul's referring to here about it, it, the one who's come into the Galatian churches is a teacher. This, and, and the one who is teaching them is teaching them that righteousness is by faith plus works. And, and they're heavy on the works. They're heavy on the works. And they're, he's convincing people that they have to abide by the law of Moses. They have to adhere to the law of Moses. And he's telling them that if you're a Gentile, you, you first have to be circumcised because that's the, that's the front door into the law of Moses into Judaism, and then once you come into the front door of Judaism through circumcision, then, then you have to obey the law of Moses. So based upon how you adhere to the law of Moses and your acceptance of Jesus as the Christ will determine if God ultimately grants you a righteous standing before him. Now, that was extremely confusing for the people because that's not what Paul taught. Paul taught just the opposite. It's by faith in Jesus plus nothing. And so when we come to 1 Corinthians 3, what's typically taught that believers are going to be judged, what, what we see in 1 Corinthians 3, the judgment here is not for believers. The judgment here are for teachers. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 3. It says, brothers and sisters, Starting with verse one, I could not address you as people who live by the spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? And what were they arguing about? What was this worldliness that was a part of them? Paul tells us in verse four. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, Apollos, are you not mere human beings? So they were, they were really lining up behind different teachers of the day. Oh, no, no, I like Paul. I like Apollos. I like Peter. And they were arguing about it. So we come to verse 5, which says, what, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Who, who are we? We're only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Paul said, and Apollos watered it. Paul and Apollo, Apollos had the same message of grace. Paul planted the seeds of grace, and Apollos came behind Paul and watered these seeds of grace. And Paul says, but God has is the one who makes the gospel of grace grow within a person. We see the growth of the gospel of grace in, in the Colossian people in, Col in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. We see how the gospel grows within a person. 
But Paul said, I planted the seed of the gospel of grace that Jesus gave him to teach. Apollos watered it. Paul planted the seeds by teaching. Apollos watered the seeds by teaching. And through the teachings of the gospel of grace, God made it grow within them. And now they're arguing over, well, I like Paul better than Apollos. And Paul's saying, no, God has given both of us a task. It, it's, he said, you're missing it. it. It's not me. It's not Apollos. It's the message. It's what God is doing through me. It's what God's doing through Apollos. It's educating you about the gospel of grace. And now you're experiencing growth from the gospel of grace. But now they're arguing over Paul and Apollos. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants the seeds of the gospel of grace and the one who waters the seeds of the gospel of grace have one purpose. And they will each be rewarded according to their own labor or according to their own work as those sent out by God to communicate the gospel of grace. Pa Apollos, P Paul, they would, they would both be rewarded based upon how they carried out this task that God gave them in communicating the gospel of grace. And Paul says in verse 9, for we, Apollos and Paul, are co-workers in God's service. Now, Paul mentions co-workers. He mentions that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse through uh, chapter 3, verse 1, all the way through 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. God sent Paul and, and Apollos and others out as competent ministers of the new covenant of grace. So when Paul is talking about, I planted the seed, he's talking about the seeds of the truths of the new covenant of grace. And he explains this for more fully in 2 Corinthians 3 through 6, 2, where we're not, no, no longer under law, but under grace. It's not the Old Testament, it's the New Testament of grace. And by Testament, we're not talking about books of the Bible. We're talking about Old Testament, the blood of an animal, that initiated and established the law of Moses and was in effect until Jesus died on the cross and established the new covenant of grace or this whole new way of relating to God apart from the law of Moses. So, so Paul and, and Apollos were co-workers in God's service of communicating the gospel of grace, the new covenant of grace to people. He said, you are God's field you are God's building. Now remember that. So they would go into a city, a field, an area, a region, Galatia, or whatever city it was they went into, or town or area, and they would communicate the gospel of grace. It's almost like the strategy here with Paul and Apollos was Paul would go in first, and Paul would lay the foundation of the gospel of grace, of the New Testament of grace, and Apollos would come behind him and educate those uh, who are now have become a part of the grace community, would educate them about the gospel of grace. Paul would evangelize them in the gospel of grace. He would build a solid foundation for the gospel of grace, for the new covenant. And then Apollos would come behind him and would build upon what Paul had established in this new covenant of grace message. So you are God's field, so they would go into the field, Paul would, as a planter, he was a church planter, he would go into the field and lay a foundation of the gospel of grace, of the new covenant. It was a new covenant foundation of grace. Apollos would come behind and build upon the foundation that Paul would establish. But in the middle of it all, it's God's field where Paul planted the seeds of the gospel of grace and established a foundation. And then Apollos would build on it. But either way, it's, it's God's field and it's God's building is, is what Paul's saying there. So, so stop arguing over whether you like me better, Paul, or whether you like Apollos better. That's all irrelevant. What's relevant is the gospel of grace, this new covenant of grace that's 
in your city, that's in your town, and a new community of grace is forming and being built up in what God has done for us in Christ. So we come to verse 10. Paul says this, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. So initially, Paul would go into cities, evangelize people with the gospel of grace, with the grace God had given him. He would lay a foundation of grace, all that God had done for us in Christ, full forgiveness of sins, complete righteousness by faith, cleansed from all sins, purified from all sins, the dwelling, the indwelling of Christ in us, knowing God as Abba Father, under no condemnation, at peace with God, holy and righteous before God, all because of what Christ has done. And all of this is apart from works. And it's all freely offered and given to us. And we receive it by faith because Jesus purchased and, and, and brought all this to us because of what he's done for us on the cross and in his resurrection. And now he lives in us and we call God Abba Father. It's all God. And that's what Paul's trying to communicate. It's all God from beginning to end. Each of us has a certain place to play and a certain role to play. Paul said, I have a role in planting. Apollos has a role in, in building upon the foundation that I lay. So Paul says, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. So Paul was very strategic. I've written a book called Strategic Church. It's all about what I'm teaching on now. Paul was very strategic in going into cities and establishing grace-based churches. Wise, strategic. I laid a foundation as a strategic builder. He's, he's building grace-based churches in cities all over the Roman Empire. He said, now, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. All right, Paul never knew who may come behind him. He was confident that when Apollos came behind him, pa Apollos was going to build correctly upon that foundation. But he, he, he wasn't always sure who was going to come behind him and what they were going to teach. So he says, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation, a gospel of grace foundation, a new covenant of grace. That's the foundation as a wise builder, as a strategic builder. And someone else comes behind me and builds on it. Those who come behind me and build on this New Testament of grace foundation, this gospel of grace foundation, this complete forgiveness of sins foundation, this complete righteousness foundation, this calling God Abba Father foundation, this foundation where we're always close to God in relationship and we can never be out of fellowship with God because all of our sins were counted against Christ. Or we spend every day enjoying what God has done for us rather than working to maintain or obtain something from God because it's all been given to us freely in Christ. He said, that's the foundation I laid, but each one who comes be behind me should build upon this foundation with great care. Verse 11, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now he's talking not only about the person of Jesus, but he's talking about the work of Jesus, that the foundation that has been established by Paul is, is not only the person of Jesus, but it's everything Jesus did for us on the cross. It's righteousness by faith. It's receiving forgiveness by faith. It's knowing we're in fellowship with God because all of our sins are forgiven, and, and Christ is the one who's brought us close to God. So, so most churches will say, yeah, this church is, is, is established. This church is established on the foundation of Jesus. Well, they're talking more just about the person of Jesus. You got to look even further. Well, what did Jesus do? Well, Paul explains that in Romans. He explains that in Ephesians. He explains it in Galatians. So if we want to know what is the foundation that Paul built or Paul laid and established in these cities that he went into, what's the foundation? Romans tells us what the foundation is that Paul built. Ephesians tells us what the foundation is. Colossians tells us what the foundation is that Epaphras built. He learned about it from Paul. He goes back to the city of Colossae and he builds this foundation of grace, which all comes to us through Christ. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12. 
If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, that's, well, let's keep reading. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, that's the day of judgment, when their, when their ministry will be judged, when what they taught will be judged. This takes us right back over to Galatians chapter 5, when Paul talked about the one who is throwing you into confusion, because Paul is the one who laid this foundation of grace for the Galatian churches. He's the one who went into the Galatian churches and laid the foundation of grace. But someone has come into the Galatian churches and they're building on the foundation that Paul had laid. All right. That person's is Paul said that person's going to be judged. And that's what Paul is referring to here. It, it's the same thing. He just goes into detail in 1 Corinthians 3 and he doesn't go into detail in Galatians chapter 5. He says, if anyone builds on this foundation, the new covenant of grace, the gospel of grace that's come to us in Christ, using gold, silver, and costly stones, that's truths that line up with the, with the gospel of grace. That's truths that line up with the new covenant of grace. They're in agreement. Wood, hay, and straw are works-based righteousness. Wood, hay, and straw are teachings that says, here's what you have to adhere to. Here's what you have to do. Back in this time, you have to be circumcised. You have to follow the law of Moses. You have to adhere to the calendar uh, of Judaism. You have to follow the clock of Judaism. You have to adhere to the Sabbaths and the festivals and all the washings and everything that goes with Judaism. Plus, yes, Jesus is the Christ. Paul would call that wood, hay, and straw. And it's the same today. Any, any teaching that says, if you really want to be right with God, you need to have a 15-minute quiet time or start with a 15-minute quiet time, and one day you can be like me and you can have an hour quiet time with God, that's, that's wood, that's hay, that's straw, because it's basing our standing upon God on our ability to have a quiet time, on how we worship God, that's that's wood, hay, and straw, you know, or, you know, the pastor standing before the people saying, you know, some of you guys are like knots on a log. You, you have no emotion. You have no expression. You know, you have no joy when it comes to your relationship with God. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. That's wood, hay, and straw. That's all going to burn up. That, that The ministry of that person is going to burn up because it has no value because he's, he's, he's teaching a man-made way, a legalistic way, a law-based way of finding acceptance with God, of relating to God rather than through what Christ has done for us. And that can express itself in many different ways. And, it, and, and so Paul is saying, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, and costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day of judgment will bring it to light. Now, this isn't a judgment on believers here. And that's what is taught about probably 99 out of 100 times when a pastor speaks on this section of scripture. He's, he's telling his audience, his church congregation, that you're going to be judged. Your works are going to be judged. It's the very opposite. What he's teaching to the congregation is what's going to be judged. And for some reason, he misses that in here. It's not the congregation that's being judged here. It's the teaching of a pastor to a congregation. That teaching is going to be judged. And what's going to be the result of the judgment? It says it will be there, the teaching of someone building on the foundation of, of the gospel of grace in its immediate context will be revealed with fire. That's judgment. And fire will test the quality of each person's work, like with gold. Gold undergoes fire and it gets out all the impurities and only the pure gold is left. It will be revealed with fire. The teaching, what, what's being taught, will be revealed with fire. It will undergo extreme judgment. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Now, what's the quality? It's the new covenant of grace. It's the gospel of grace. It's what Christ has done for us. That's the real quality. 
And anybody's teaching that does not have the quality of what Christ has done for us and that our righteousness is by faith alone in Christ alone and our right standing and our peace with God is through only Christ and our fellowship with God is because of what Christ has done. It's not our quiet times. It's not how we worship God. It's not whether we're in a small group or not. I'm convinced the majority of believers have never been fully communicated the gospel of grace. And they've only probably on a scale from one to a hundred, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe a five is what they've been taught. There's so much they haven't been taught about what God has done for them in Christ. Those who are teaching these congregations their, their teachings are going to undergo judgment. And they're, they're, they're either going to be rewarded based upon what they taught about what God has done for us in Christ, or they're going to lose reward based upon what they didn't teach. The mixing of yeast with dough. Those who mix yeast in with the dough, th- there's nothing there for them. They're going to be saved, but... Their, their, their ministry is, is going to show forth no fruit. Each person's work here is the teachers. It's those who are teaching on the foundation that was laid, the foundation of grace. And Paul said, those who come behind me and teach, their, their work is going to be um, undergo judgment. And that's what he's referring to in Galatians 5. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. The teacher, the one coming and, and, and teaching behind Paul, if, if their teaching survives judgment and the only teaching that's going to survive judgment is new covenant teaching, not a mixture of old covenant and new covenant, not a mixture of law and grace, not a mixture of yeast and dough, not a mixture of works and grace, it's, it's Jesus and what he did and, and, and faith in what he's done. That's the teaching that's going to survive the evaluation, uh, the judgment of the teaching. If it is burned up, what they taught, if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. That's the teacher will suffer loss of reward, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Now, I have a blog writing on my website, gracereach.org, where the title of it is something like escaping through the flames in context. Now, a person, a pastor will get up and teach on this, and he'll look at his congregation. He'll say, some of y'all, you're you're not going to have any works. Your works are going to burn up, and the seat of your pants are going to be smoking, but you're going to be saved, but but, but your your bottom's going to be on fire when you escape the flames of, because you haven't done anything. And, and that's just ridiculous teaching there. It's, it's, it's arrogance, it's self-righteousness. And when it's what, what it's really talking about is the pastor who's communicating these extraordinary, I don't even, that's not the word, but this terrible, terrible teachings. It's, it's their teachings that's going to be burned up. Yes, they're going to be saved, because salvation, thankfully, is not having the right theology. Thankfully, it's belief in Jesus, because if it's having and teaching the correct theology, no one will be saved. Salvation is by believing in Jesus, period. Do we have to have everything right when it comes to that? No, because if we do, then no one can be saved. It's, it's, it's trusting and believing in Jesus, even though the, our theology may be wrong in a lot of ways. It's still faith in Jesus that saves, even though it may be faith in Jesus plus works could be somebody's theology. That person still saved, though their theology and their theology and what they taught and their doctrines and how they communicated uh, to their people that may all burn up, but they themselves are going to be saved. And that's what Paul's saying here. Verse 16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? So he's talking about the church right here. You, the church, you are God's building. Goes back up to verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 3. For we are God's co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. You are God's building. Okay, verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? You're God's building. He's building a grace family. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2. 
We're the spiritual temple of God. We're where somebody comes to faith in Jesus, they become a part of the building of God, the family of God, this grace building, not a law building in Jerusalem, but this grace spiritual family, this grace building that's, that, that's, all, that's being built all over the world, this grace building. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, now who's the anyone in the context? The anyone are the teachers that come into the churches and teach something other than the gospel of grace, something other than the New Testament of grace, some types of works-based way of relating to God. That's the anyone here. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Now, in context, in context, this is talking about a teacher and, and, and destroy, I think that that person's reward, that person's reward will be destroyed in the judgment. They will not receive a reward in the judgment because their teaching was not new covenant based, nor was it grace based teaching. It was law-based, works-based. It was yeast mixed with the dough of grace. And you together, for God's temple is sacred. That's the church. That's this family of grace, this foundation of grace that Paul laid. All God has done for us in Christ. And you together, those who come to faith in Christ, are that temple. You are that, that building. Now, sadly, what happens is pastors will take these verses to show, to say that if you commit suicide, you're going to hell. All right, this is where that comes from. This is where that false teaching comes from. Suicide sends per, a person to hell because your body's the temple of God. And if, if, if you destroy God's temple through suicide, you're going to hell. That is so far from the context of this teaching, but that's what the majority of believers have been taught. That's what they understand. And that type of teaching will burn up in judgment. So um, it's so important, and we'll end with this, that when we study Scripture, we cannot isolate Scripture from its context. And whenever we isolate Scripture from its context, then we can formulate anything we want those verses to say. And what Paul is saying here is when teachers who are saying that they're teachers of the gospel, they're teachers of Jesus, when their teachings are not in a line with the gospel of grace and the new covenant of grace, their teachings are going to burn up. Their ministries are going to burn up in judgment. There will be no reward for them. Yes, they will be saved, but they will not have a reward. If you want to keep reading through this, you can read all the way down into chapter four. We'll just read chapter four real quick, and we'll, we'll bring this to an end rather than pick up on it next week. Chapter four, verse one. This then is how you ought to regard us, us being Paul and Apollos, is how you ought to regard us. As servants of Christ, the ambassadors of Christ, we see that in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 18 through 20, eight, well, 2 Corinthians 5 through 2 Corinthians 6, 2, co-workers in the communication of the new covenant of grace, ambassadors of Christ. God is no longer counting your sins against you. Righteousness by faith. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. What, what are these mysteries? The gospel of grace, this new covenant of grace, understanding what God has done. And Paul says, I've been entrusted to communicate this message. Apollos has been entrusted to communicate this message that God's revealed about all he's done for us in Christ. Verse 2, chapter 4, 1 Corinthians. Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust, responsibility, and ministry is what Paul's referring to here. You can read about that responsibility in 2 Corinthians 3, the beginning of it. Paul talks about this. He's been given the message of the new covenant to communicate to people, and this has been given to him by God. It is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Paul wanted to be faithful to finish the race that Jesus had called him to 
of communicating the gospel of grace. And he writes about that in 2 Corinthians or in Acts chapter 20, verses 23 and 24. And then in his final letter to Timothy, he says, I've finished the race. I've completed the work that Jesus has given me. He talks about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust uh, must prove faithful. Paul said, verse 3, I care very little if I am judged by you, the Corinthians, or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. That's what he's referring to back in Galatians chapter 5, that this teacher had gone into these churches or going to be judged by Jesus. Paul and Apollos were going to be judged by Jesus and their teaching, what they taught. If they taught correctly, it would survive judgment and they would receive a reward. If it was not good teaching, it was, if it was mixing yeast with a dough, then it would be burned up. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. My, my teachings is where he's referring to. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. He says, Corinthians, you're, you're judging Apollos, and you're judging me, and you're saying, I like Paul, and I, well, I like Apollos. He says, we're just fulfilling the task that God has given us to do. It's not your right to judge. Jesus is the ultimate judge of our ministry. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes, and he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness, and he will expose the motives of the heart. And at each and at that time, each teacher that's building on the foundation of grace will receive their praise from God. Either being they will receive praise from God, reward from God, or they will experience loss. And so that's what's being referred to in Galatians chapter 5, when Paul says in verse 10, I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view on righteousness, how a person is made righteous. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, NIV says, will have to pay the price. It will be judged. And when will that judgment happen? Well, we just read about it in 2 Corinthians 3 through, I'm sorry, in 1 Corinthians 3 through 1 Corinthians 4. 